All right, thank you. Um, Secretary General will be traveling over the weekend. Uh, he will be going to Geneva, where on Monday he will deliver remarks at the opening of the 49th regular session of the Human Rights Council. Later, he will take part in a press conference to launch the new report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, titled Climate Change 2022, Impacts, Adaptation, Vulnerability. Uh, while in Geneva, he will also uh, have a series of uh, bilateral meetings. We expect him back here on Monday afternoon. Uh, and there's also a chance that he may appear in front of you uh, later this afternoon at the Security Council stakeout. We will keep you posted on that. Um, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, the head of our peacekeeping operations, uh, is in the Central African Republic today, where he began a four-day visit. Um, he's expected to meet a number of uh, local leaders, including the president, uh, Fustin Archange uh, Twadera. He will also meet civil society representatives and people directly affected by insecurity in the country. Uh, as you may have seen, uh, four of our peacekeeping uh, colleagues arrested last Friday were released yesterday. Uh, Moncur Ndiaye, the head of the mission, reiterated that the UN will continue to work to ensure the protection of our personnel and assets in all circumstances, and we're happy they've been released. Um, I want to highlight three uh, ongoing humanitarian situations. As uh, I think Martin said, there are other, uh, we are also keeping a close eye on a lot of other uh, places. On Yemen, um, we want to reiterate our concern about the grave situation in the country, including the impact of the ongoing conflict, which is causing civilian casualties on a daily basis. More than 23,000 people have been displaced since the start of the year, most of them in Hudeida, Marib, uh, Shabwa, and Taiz governorates. They, are, they join uh, more than 4 million men, women, and children who've been displaced across Yemen since the latest escalation got underway in 2015. Aid agencies are doing everything they can to respond to people's needs, but acute funding shortages are threatening the flow of humanitarian assistance. At the start of this year, two-thirds of major UN aid programs had already been forced to reduce or close due to lack of cash. Further cuts are on the horizon if funding is not received. As it is, food rations have already been cut by half for eight million people. Those people may, may soon stop receiving food assistance from the UN altogether. We call on all donors to pledge generously at a high-level pledging conference for Yemen, which is scheduled for March 16th, co-hosted by uh, ourselves, the governments of Sweden and Switzerland. We also urge donors to commit funds before the pledging conference to avoid any major disruption in our humanitarian uh, operations. In Afghanistan, as we had told you, I think a group of eight senior emergency experts from UN agencies and international NGOs uh, have been in the in the country. Um, today, uh, they called for urgent support to life-saving humanitarian action in Afghanistan after a five-day mission to the country. The emergency experts said they witnessed an enormity of human suffering in Afghanistan, but that they also saw humanitarian organizations able to scale up operations despite massive operational constraints, including the ongoing banking and liquidity crisis. According to our humanitarian colleagues, more than 24 million people, that represents 59% of the Afghan population, now require life-saving assistance in the country. That is a staggering 30% increase since 2021. Uh, the Afghan humanitarian uh, P response plan this year, which is our largest humanitarian appeal ever, ever launched for a single country, calls for 4.44 billion US dollars to provide aid to over 22 million people. It's only 13% funded. And also on Afghanistan, a quick note to say that the head of UNICEF, Catherine Russell, just concluded a three-day trip to the country. In the statement, Ms. Russell noted the streets of Kabul, scores of very young children dart in and out of traffic, chasing cars and asking for money. In a hospital in Kandahar, she saw emaciated babies lie motionless, two to a bed, too weak to even cry, amid a spike of cases of severe acute malnutrition. Um, more on her, their press release. On Ethiopia, <clears throat> the conflict in the Afar region continues to develop displacement. Excuse me, the 
conflict in the Afar region continues to cause displacement, which worsens humanitarian needs. Regional authorities estimate that hundreds of thousands have been displaced by fighting in recent months, including some 200,000 people living in areas that are hard for humanitarian uh, uh, workers to reach. Humanitarian response is scaling up to accessible areas in Afar, but still remains far too insufficient. Assessments have been found uh, to uh, have found priority needs for food, protection for children, and health. Humanitarian assistance also continues in Amhara region. More than 6.8 million people have received food assistance in the past two months including over 230,000 that have been assisted by ourselves and NGO partners in the past week. Some areas near the boundary with Tigray, however, remain inaccessible for humanitarians. In the Tigray region itself, we, along with our humanitarian partners, are continuing to scale back operations due to lack of supplies, lack of fuel, lack of cash. No relief convoys have reached Tigray since mid-December, and we are now at the end of February. During the past week, uh, we, along with our partners, have managed to airlift some 47 metric tons of medical supplies to Tigray, including antibiotics, medicines for malaria and diabetes. Uh, but as you know, uh, airlifts cannot replace uh, truck convoys in terms of volume and cost. Uh, however, lack of fuel um, is, remains a major setback in Tigray as an obstacle for dispatching supplies to health facilities throughout the region. Uh, just a quick note that you will have seen the Gare Pedersen, our envoy for Syria, brief the council this morning. He said militarily front lines remain unshifted, but we still see all the signs of an ongoing hot conflict. Any of a number of flashpoints could ignite a broader conflict, config, conflagration, he warned. Mr. Pedersen said we have now, he's now set a, we have now set a date for convening the seth, seventh session of the small body of the Syrian owned Syrian-led UN Facilitated Constitutional Committee, and that is March 21st. Uh, Joyce Masuya, the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, also briefed the Security Council on the humanitarian situation in Syria. She said the world is failing the people of Syria. Syria now ranks as one of the world's 10 most food insecure countries, forcing families to pull children out of school or use child marriage as a coping strategy. And a quick uh, COVID update from Vietnam, where our UN team, led by the resident coordinator, the acting resident coordinator, Rana Flowers, continues to support the authorities in health and socioeconomic response recoveries due to the pandemic. The team and authorities have trained healthcare workers, provided health and nutrition services for pregnant women, mothers, and their children, provided water, sanitation, and hygiene supplies to schools and health centers. The team has also supported the economic recovery of women in micro and small enterprises. Vietnam has achieved the goal of vaccinating 100% of the targeted population, that's people 18 or above. Of all vaccines landing in Vietnam, over 51 million doses uh, were received through the COVAX facility. Um, and just to round up, round up this note uh, on a happy note, um, which small, uh, well, small country, which country small in size uh, with a very nice beachfront has paid its budget dues in full? What continent says a lot? Monaco. Uh, 52. We thank our friends in Monaco for that payment. Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, a couple of um, follow-up questions. Um, on Ukraine, has the Secretary General been speaking to any um, Russian or Ukrainian officials? And while he is in uh, Geneva, do you expect him to hold any talks on the Russian invasion of I, I think we have to see uh, who's in Geneva and what uh, what we are doing, um, what the program will be, the f actual program will be uh, once he uh, once he gets there. So we will keep you uh, updated on uh, on that. Um, uh, no, uh, well, I, I think as Mr. Griffiths uh, told you, he spoke to the Ukrainian ambassador. The Secretary General had been in touch. Uh, with Ambassador Nebenzi, I think 
a couple of days ago, but nothing new to, to report. And on Ethiopia, um, are all of those trucks still um, waiting to get into Tigray? Yeah, I mean, we haven't had a truck convoy since mid-December. Could you get us a number of how many trucks are waiting yeah. Uh, yeah. To, uh, to get in? Will do. Thanks. OK. Yes, Lenka. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, follow up and just to confirm, uh, the Secretary General spoke with um, Foreign Minister Lavrov on February 14, mm -hmm. but has he spoken to Putin at all within the past no. months or something? He has not. And uh, one more question, please. Would he like to go to Moscow or has well, he I mean, requested the, the, the meeting? I, I think, he, excuse me, as he said, uh, his good offices are available. All the parties involved know that. Uh, Benno and then Stefano. Thank you. Um, did the Secretary General lose trust in Russia after constant lying about starting war and then actually doing it? The, I think the Secretary General... Uh, the Secretary General works cooperatively and fully with every member state in the Security Council, uh, in, in every member state in, in the UN, uh, and will continue, uh, will continue to do so. Then I have a follow-up. How does the SG intend to work together with one of its most powerful members, one of the most powerful members of the UN, when its le leader seems to be the opposite of everything the UN stands for? I mean, I think the, the Secretary General has expressed his uh, opinion and his feelings pretty strongly uh, in the last uh, two days. Uh, uh, about how he feels about the situation. That remains that lines of communications with the head of every member state in this organization uh, needs to be kept open uh, if he's going to fulfill his responsibilities as Secretary General. Stefano. Yeah. Yes, it's a follow-up on this last two. So you say, practically, the Secretary General has been saying, the door is open. I'm here. But uh, shouldn't the uh, Secretary General be the one active and ask, actually, to President Putin, or, I think I need to talk to you? I, I think it is, and I can't speak for others, but I think all the parties involved know very well that the Secretary General's good offices are available. Yes, sir. Okay, so my question is, uh, today Russian, I mean, Kremlin s seems to send a conflicting uh, message. First, they, they still have this operation near Kiev, but yet uh, they said they're open to, to a negotiation probably will take place in Minsk. So what would be the response from, uh, from the United Nations? Well, I think the, it's, the, the, it's not for the UN to, to respond. We, we are not party to whatever negotiations may happen. Obviously, uh, we would be, we would encourage all the parties uh, to negotiate, right? I mean, to, to dialogue. The Secretary General has been very clear that there is a need for restraint, there's a need to hold the fighting, and there's a need for dialogue. Okay, uh, Polina Kubiak, you are up. Uh, 